We're Deaf Expo in California, the largest and fastest growing independent show in the country. Some of you may have heard about Deaf Expo from other enthusiastic people, but did you know that Deaf Expo is run completely by deaf and hard of hearing people? The goal of Deaf Expo is to provide a bridge between the deaf and hearing communities and share the rich heritage, language, and culture of this large minority group, making Deaf Expo an important and impactful meeting site. As many as 28 million Americans have varying degrees of hearing loss. Now, we've all attended special interest events like home shows, cat shows, business expos, boat shows, and so on. Now, Deaf Expo has filled a niche in this market, giving us our own show where information on products and services can be shared, where people from all over the country can make contacts with other people, see old friends, make new friends, and participate in everything all under one roof. There are no cultural barriers with clowns. It doesn't matter which culture you are from. Doesn't matter. Clowns love everyone. All people are the same with clowns. Look at me as an actor. Not deaf, not black. I'm an actor. Look at my skills. It depends on talent. If you look at me as being deaf, you're limiting me, and I can't get in anywhere. For example, many commercials involve hearing people with no talking, no signing, anything, just looks. There are many beautiful deaf people who could be involved in commercials. Really, they can. Many times I'm told you can't because they look at me as a deaf person. But put that aside, they'll realize, oh, deaf people can get into commercials. How Deaf West Theater has affected the deaf community, or any community, is simple. We hire deaf actors so they can get jobs. It's nice as a professional actor to earn money, not for free. It's also for the hearing community, so the hearing community can become more aware of the deaf theater profession. The people who attend are fascinated by the deaf art form so it's nice to combine the deaf and hearing communities and not just segregating them. They learn from each other. If the hearing community wants to know more about the deaf culture, they can simply come in and see our theater. They sit reaping the double benefits, enjoying themselves while learning about deaf culture. Storytelling is important because that's how deaf uh, heritage and culture are passed on over the years. There have been many other avenues, movies and poetry for example, but stories are the most common way that culture is passed on. So now for including this in schools and education, you can expand on that. You can take that story and you can analyze it for its technique, how it's structured, its form. So deaf people can learn its inner scope and pass on the culture while enhancing their literacy. I say enhancing because literacy is tied to your knowledge of the world in general. How deaf people and children could learn about the world is through stories in their own language and at the same time reading. One can combine both reading and storytelling together. Our culture underwater is communication ease of communication between each diver. We can use our signs underwater to talk to each other rather than taking the regulator off the mouth and having bubbles come out of the mouth while we're trying to talk. You can't do that underwater. Our communication skills are more useful underwater for everybody. I look forward to the day when we can finally go into movie theaters with captions. Why? because all that time I've gone into theaters but I'm not able to understand what is being said. 
It will also be nice, too, because my husband is hearing and we've never had a movie theater date. Instead, we have dates in our living room where we rent home videos. Now they're available with captions. But we look forward to the movie theaters becoming accessible. This is a wonderful new technology that allows two people to communicate on telephone lines in real time at the same time. It's incredible, and it's never been in America before. It's in Japan now, but has just been brought to America for the deaf community. It's really exciting. Everybody is excited. Many deaf employees work for Motorola. Some of the departments consult with deaf employees to learn about their background and to help with their products, develop better products for the deaf community. We want to offer what is needed to provide better communication with the deaf. This is so easy to use, you just press the keys. Kids like it, it's so easy. Children learn English by pressing the buttons and they match English with ASL, PSE, or both. Hearing people like it because they can see it, understand the meaning, and relate it to ASL. The Greater Los Angeles Council on Deafness, also known as GLAD here in Los Angeles, has a big project going. We have a one-stop service center for deaf people. On the first floor, we have services of all kinds, everything from A to Z, health, regular social services, and advocacy. The second floor will have the administrative offices, and the third floor will have 14 units of housing. There is a fourth floor, which is a common area for a library and other things, you name it. Bob Whitebrick invented the telephone TTY for deaf people. He is a very important person in deaf people's lives. If you go to the TTY Museum, as you go in there, interestingly, there is a picture of Morse, inventor of the Morse code for the telegraph. Next to that is A.G. Bell, who invented the telephone. Next to that is Edison, who invented the electric light. Then, after that, we had the TTY network through the combination of these three. My goal is to expose this museum to allow people to know all about how deaf culture can become a part of American culture. With the rapid improvement in living conditions for deaf and hard of hearing Americans, more responsible corporations are participating and recognizing this large market segment that has been overlooked for quite some time. Deaf Expo and its partners provide role models to be emulated by others. Come and join us as we share viewpoints on the diversity of this vibrant community and the issues that affect the quality of life for deaf and hard of hearing Americans everywhere. The word access could mean different things depending on the person's point of view. For example, suppose you have an audience of hearing people and the speaker is deaf. Now of course an interpreter is needed to communicate to the audience and also for the audience to ask questions or to discuss issues. Now reverse that and have a deaf event. A hearing person comes in and they will probably need an interpreter to communicate and the deaf person might need an interpreter to talk to them. It is the same rule for families. Suppose you have a hearing family who has a deaf child and the family does not know sign language. They try to talk and convey information. Information is primarily limited to speaking and listening, which is pretty limiting. Ironically, often you have a deaf family with a hearing child. That hearing child grows up hearing and signing. They fit into the world through school, through music and sound, and at the same time, signing with their parents. That hearing child becomes bilingual. Why can't they give the same benefit to the deaf child in an all-hearing family? They are pretty limited in access to information and communication. Parents who decide an oral education is best for the deaf child are themselves not accepting the deafness. That's their way of covering up by thinking we have a normal child when in actuality they do not. 
I feel it's important for them to accept it. What is important here is language. When a deaf child has language, they can interact with each other. What's not important is that they speak normally. It's not normal. It's not fair to the deaf child. More importantly, it's natural to have language to enable interaction and for language to develop so the parents understand the needs of the child to satisfy their needs. This is important for their growth. A child raised orally has to struggle and get frustrated. Is that normal? No, it's not fair to the deaf child. They need closer interaction in order to develop their growth. I've noticed deaf children are so cute, they laugh more, have character, and are so expressive when they sign with their eyes sparkling, and they're very active. Children in mainstream schools are sweet and active too, but the concepts are very different between these two groups. Mainstream children emulate the hearing world, where residential children emulate the deaf world. They grow up around deafness and feel a belonging to the community. They can balance the hearing and deaf worlds and fit into either. The child from the mainstream school can fit into the deaf community too, but still sign with quite a bit of finger spelling. The child from the residential school may not spell words, but they have internalized the syntax of ASL. It's quite a contrast. It often occurs that parents don't accept their baby's deafness. The baby suffers from cochlear implants. I propose a different idea. It's more important that a deaf child learn language first. Open communication helps a child learn language. The cochlear implants are ideal for adults who could previously hear, and that's fine. They can go ahead and have the implants because they have the memory of sound in their brains already. However, children do not have those memories, which makes the implant worthless. It's really interesting that parents come up to me and say, the doctor told them not to learn sign language, and they're very confused about which communication mode they should adopt for their deaf child. We try to inform parents that what is not important are the language options, which one and what label to give it. What is important is to first establish communication. The same thing happens at the schools. Often an interpreter is put into a classroom and the school feels they have satisfied their accessibility obligation. That is not true. Actually, the deaf children need to study language. Language develops when they are young, not later. An interpreter is fine in the classroom, but not one with equal skills to that child. The interpreter needs more skill to be able to model different language options for the child. Who decides which is best? ASL, English, total communication, the deaf child must analyze and determine which is best for that child. That is important. I feel it's important to show several different options for educational opportunities. You must focus on their language development needs. If you delay, it is sometimes too late. It's important to respect their right to have communication first. Second, when they can communicate clearly, you can teach language. This gives them a better start. Deaf people can do anything, but if we continue to oppress and hinder their language, it'll never happen. You know, deaf people who went to a deaf school were never taught to sign a petition, never taught to register to vote, or how to organize. It's up to them to make it happen. If they don't do anything, nothing will happen. People get confused about what's right and wrong about which method they should use for their children, cued speech, C, or ASL. They need all the information they can get. It's overwhelming. I feel it's our responsibility to tell them what is available out there and to know what is the right way to do it. Now, they have to take the right steps and be more active rather than being apathetic, letting others take care of us. We must be active, do the work, and not leave it to others. Right. I'm what they call a cultural mulatto. I'm not accepted in a deaf community, and I'm not accepted in any community. It's very hard for me to be in the middle. Uh, I feel isolated. I feel like they, people don't understand, because uh, except, the, the, except for those people that are hard of hearing, uh, in various degrees. Uh, being mulatto, being hard of hearing, it's a very difficult problem for me. And difficult for those people that are in my same position. 
I am really comfortable about having the flexibility to go between the deaf world and the hearing world because I was raised orally and then I learned how to sign at the age of 16. Because of my successful mainstream environment, I was able to socialize with my hearing peers. Now with my job, I have to work with hearing people. So I'm thankful for that. And at the same time, I'm happy to have the benefits of the deaf culture too. That's part of me, that's who I am. I've gone to Europe, New Zealand, and Japan. The communication was easy. Signs themselves are universal with the natural gestures like eat and sign. There are no politics, even though people are from different backgrounds. We get together and we can establish communication. Being deaf is great. You can't compare that with hearing people. Hearing people don't understand each other, but with signs it's great. The many issues that deaf and hard of hearing people face are varied. We have come a long way since the 1970s with the rapid growth in services, products, information, and recognition which has helped to unite this large community today. We all continue to strive for change and improvements to benefit future generations. What makes a deaf person look, act, and think differently? Society has tended to look at deaf people from the pathological, audiological, and medical perspective. However, deaf people do not consider themselves disabled and do not necessarily share the hearing culture that other persons with disabilities do. This negative view of the deaf community has been primarily for political purposes. Deaf people embrace the third most used language in the country, American Sign Language which is formally recognized as a legitimate language with its own syntax, grammar, and semantics. Therefore, they should be seen by society as a linguistics minority with its own rich and unique culture and heritage rather than the widely accepted stereotypical perception and classification in the disabled arena. I call our group a linguistic minority. Are we disabled? I don't think so. The classification of disabled does fit somewhat with 49 million people of all categories who have disabilities. Together, we have more power to approach the government and be able to fight for our rights. In that way, yes. But other than that, it's a little bit different. The disability groups are different from us. The deaf have a culture and their own language. Our deaf heritage is very important to the group. The hearing community is also made up of different cultures. For example, Hispanic, French, and Native Americans are all linguistic minorities. Some people think that deaf people have a problem, a disability, while other people view us as a linguistic minority group. That is really a question of perception. How deaf people look at themselves is different from how hearing people see us. People have no right to label a person who is deaf as disabled. That should be decided by the deaf people themselves, whether we are suffering or getting along fine. For example, a 30-year-old man who loses his hearing knows the difference between living in the hearing world and suddenly being in the new deaf world, he could feel disabled. Deaf people who are born deaf and know nothing other than their own life, and culture, and way of living will get along just fine. The community socializes, celebrates, has a good time. What's missing? Nothing. Nothing that we feel is missing. So the question of disability for deaf people depends on how we live, our way of doing things, how people see us, how we see them. In our view, we are not disabled if we were born deaf. Deaf Expo is an annual event held every November in California, where deaf and hard of hearing Americans gather to share their rich culture, language, and heritage which makes them one of the proudest linguistic minorities in the country. To share this great feeling, all of you should come and visit Deaf Expo. All 
Personal views expressed during this program do not necessarily reflect that of their employers or organizations, Deaf Expo and Kaleidoscope Television. Deaf Community at a Crossroad, only $19.95 plus $3 shipping and handling. Send to Deaf Expo, 4717 Laurel Canyon Boulevard, number 210, North Hollywood, California, 91607-3944, or call TTY, area code 818-760-3292, or on the voice relay at 800-735-2922. Visa and MasterCard accepted. Everyone is invited to the Deaf Expo, an annual event that brings people together for fun, entertainment, and plenty of food for thought. To get more information about the next Deaf Expo, contact us at Deaf Expo Information, 4717 Laurel Canyon Boulevard, number 210, North Hollywood, California, 91607-3944. Deaf Expo has a wide variety of merchandise items. Items include postcards, t-shirts, pins, water bottles, pogs, bumper stickers, and magnets. Souvenirs are available year-round from each show. Personal checks, money orders, and credit cards are accepted. For a free catalog, contact Def Expo General Store, 4717 Laurel Canyon Boulevard, number 210, North Hollywood, California, 91607-3944. We need your help to make our dream come true. The EFTC Board of Directors, who oversees the Def Expo, has established a long-term capital gains fundraising campaign. We welcome donations from supporters who want to help Deaf Expo purchase land for a permanent year-round convention and tournament facility. This facility would be 100% accessible to meet the needs of deaf and hard of hearing customers. It would also be available for use by other organizations for conventions, tournaments, retreats, and silent weekends. We need to raise $2 million to purchase land and basic construction. All tax-deductible contributions will be directed to a separate interest-bearing account with 20th Century Investors in St. Louis, Missouri. Donors can also designate the ASL Ranch as the beneficiary of a bequest through his or her will. To get a brochure with more information, contact ASL Ranch, 4717 Laurel Canyon Boulevard, number 210. North Hollywood, California, 91607-3944.